All right, thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Gnostic Studies. And this evening we'd like to do a class. A lecture. But before we do that, we want to do a review of the previous material. So we'll drop that link in the comments. We covered combination of Arcana 3 last week. And as always, we try and provide a handout with the uh, with a, a summary of the material from the previous class. So that's what you're looking at here on the screen: the Hermetic Masonry in the Gnostic Tradition, Notes Three. And this handout is available at the bottom of the link we just put in the comments area. So we talked about Arcana 7, 8, and 9, <clears throat> and how are these are related to the, the qualities that we need. That is to yoke the passions, is Arcanum 7. To yoke the beast. To learn how to direct the chariot of our own life. Arcanum 8 is about vigilance and justice. It's also related with being firm. The firmness needs to convert itself into the very axis of life the central gravitational point of our existence. In Arcanum 9 is the hidden light, which manifests itself in initiation, understanding how to enter into the mysteries, the internal mysteries, which is through the transmutation of the creative energy, also through what's called the individual work, because the hermit, Arcanum 9, is an individual by himself, him or herself. Because the path between us and divinity is, is that, just that. Others can help us for sure. But it's up to us to make those efforts, to walk that path, to take those steps in our own personal, individual initiation so that we can receive the light which is illumination. And then we studied Arcanum 11 and 12 related with the esoteric commandments, which are commandment 11, do your duty, and 12, seek the straight, narrow, and difficult path which leads to the light. That is, Make your light shine. Making our light shine internally doesn't mean anything necessarily externally. We're not talking about other people observing anything. We're talking about eliminating the ego so that we can extract the light from the darkness because the light, the consciousness, is now trapped inside of ego. And we need... Buddhist annihilation to dissolve those desires, those psychic aggregates, those egos that we carry within. Uh, because this class was about initiatic symbolism, we talked about the story of Jonah and the fish or whale. Eliphas Levy gave his explanation of the symbolism of the whale. 
And we talked about the legend of the death of Osiris. And then we went into certain aspects uh, related with the process of initiation that Samael and Beor connects with what are called the three days or three periods. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a somewhat complex um, series of, of things that we talked about there, and so we'll leave it to the page if you want to review that material, but we attempted to summarize some of the information related with the arcana that's given when he talked about that here on this second handout. So all that information is available to you through the uh, handout at the bottom of the page. And if you have any questions or comments, we refer you to that material. And it, and, but you can always ask us now or comment on the, the video or um, email us uh, or message us. We're available at GnosticStudies at Gmail. So feel free. Well, let's jump into today's material. Today we're doing something a little different. We're going to cover French masonry or Masonic symbolism. What's interesting about the history of masonry, nowadays we, we know of, um, generally people know about Scottish Rite masonry because it has 33 degrees and they think that that is, um, you know, different than the, uh, how to say it, they, that's highlighted for whatever reason. And so, where did where did this so-called Scottish Rite Masonry come from? There's other systems of Masonry. There's York Rite Masonry in the United States. Those are the two main systems that uh, are popular, we could say. But there's there's plenty of other systems that are less popular. Uh, in Europe, they have other systems. Uh, continental Europe. In, in France and in Germany. And it's interesting to study these systems because as we know, we've been studying Hermetic Masonry and we'll see today where that term comes from. It comes from a, a book by um, a French Mason. That Masonry is related with the stone or the rock. A Mason is a, a worker with a stone. Someone who, who knows how to build or uh, work with stone. So it's, it's got a beautiful symbolism when we understand the relationship with the alchemical knowledge that Gnosis teaches us that um, the, the masters from the previous two centuries have, have been explaining, trying to help humanity. And so it therefore implies that the system had that knowledge, the knowledge of white tantra, the knowledge of alchemy. So if we go into it and we start looking at the history, where do these things come from? We find some very interesting uh, teachings that, that are, you know, older, maybe from the 1700s or 1800s, but, but they have value at the very least for us understanding how to use our knowledge of Kabbalah to extract the, the symbols from a, a, uh, an exchange or what's called a catechism, which is a question and answers. You have questions that, that uh, are asked and answers that are fixed. So fixed question, fixed answer, and in some cases, they need to be memorized. So we'll look at some of those today. 
In the next class, we'll look at them in more in-depth, specific ones. But let's jump into today's material. And as always, feel free, if you have any questions or comments, to, uh, to drop them in the comments area. So, Kabbalistic and Alchemical Symbolism in Old French Freemasonry, Part 1, French Freemasonry and High grade or high degree masonry. The role of French masonry in the development of higher degrees, those beyond the first three, the first three degrees are sometimes referred to as Blue Lodge, which are apprentice, companion, or sometimes called fellow in English, fellow craft, and master, third degree. The role of French masonry in the development of higher degrees, those beyond the first three degrees, is not so well recognized in the English-speaking world. A historical analysis of manuscripts, many of which are now becoming available digitally, will show us that much of what is called Scottish Rite Masonry was actually grown and developed in France. But it does not end there. So-called Egyptian Rite Masonry also has its roots in France as well. It's not clear when exactly the first Masonic Lodge was established in France. Some traditions say that it was in 1688, but according to historians, it seems that at about 1725 was when the first Masonic Lodge was established in Paris. For some reason, possibly because France was a traditionally Roman Catholic country, Masonry became relatively popular even after it was condemned by the Pope in 1738. In the mid-1700s, a mixed, so-called mixed form of Freemasonry, meaning that women were also admitted, became popular with the French, which they called adoptive rite, or masonry of adoption. Since it was generally known that traditional Blue Lodge masonry the first three degrees, came from England. As new French degrees and rituals were be beginning to emerge, they were often given the adjective English, Irish, or Scottish. And then they'd add maybe another adjective like philosophical Scottish, um, old Scottish, old English, old Irish, um, Something like that. So they'd have multiple adjectives, but they'd include something implying that it came from the, uh, the islands there off, off the, uh, the coast of, of what's called continental Europe. Um, so, so how is it that these degrees are emerging, right? Well... When you study masonry or you study the, the system, you see that it relies on a couple things. The, the catechism, as we mentioned, question and answer, which may or may not reveal a lot, it, it makes a connection, but generally is somewhat cryptic. But also there's another other things which we're not studying specifically which are uh, certain movements or practices, um, so could be called ritual, that's done uh, related with certain symbols, which they may have physical symbols. Like we'll read a story, right? Like we read the story about the death of Osiris, and there are certain symbols that are highlighted in the story. They may have... A, a ritual or sort of like a play that's going on where certain things are highlighted. Certain symbols, certain colors, certain words, certain numbers, things like that. So once uh, a person becomes, we could say, familiar with that, they may be inspired, for better or worse, to create their own version or to incorporate some other uh, esoteric knowledge into that, into that same methodology in order to teach. Now remember, we're talking about 
1700s, 1800s, there's not television, there's not uh, radio. So that's, that's kind of how things go. You, you have to have a play or a show or music, but there aren't necessarily recordings of it. So it's just a different way that's related with those times. But anyway, what happened was they would give these, these adjectives to their degrees, not all the time would it be English, Irish, or Scottish, but certainly those were given in an effort to legitimize their things, which is technically lying. <laughs> but uh, that doesn't mean that the esoteric knowledge behind it wasn't valuable, wasn't useful. But people that doubt the, the connection, the French connection, so to speak, between Scottish Rite Masonry and uh, French degrees should study this manuscript, the Baylot, Baylot manuscript FM 415, which is um, dated into the early 1760s. You can get it in French. I haven't seen translations in English. And I have seen people that say, the articles that, that haven't looked at the original French or, or haven't shared the original French, but they say, oh, this manuscript doesn't say this, it doesn't say that. It was associated with a Scottish or a, um, a system called the Rite of Perfection, and the comparison of the names of the degrees and some of the symbolism in the different degrees. It only had, I believe it was either 27 or 29 degrees. Shows that there's a lot of similarities with what we now call Scottish Rite masonry. In any case, don't want to dork out too much on that type of stuff, but just uh, many people, you know, are unaware of that connection and are not, they, they're, they're sort of uh, miss this lineage, which is what we're going to be studying in this class and the next class, which is the, the sort of informal or unformalized degrees and their alchemical, Kabbalistic, hermetic, uh, you know, esoteric teachings that are very useful when we're in these studies. Many interesting alchemical degrees emerged from France during the mid to late 1700s. Of particular interest are the alchemical degrees of the Baron de Choudy, spelled many different ways, which we hope to study in another course. They're very beautiful and have incorporated Kabbalistic and alchemical symbolism into their practices and catechisms. There's also astrological stuff, mythological things, uh, the Golden Fleece. It's, it's quite comprehensive. By the late 1700s, there were many different rites and orders throughout France, and consequently there was an attempt to organize them, and this resulted in some rites uniting with or being absorbed by others, as well as some being considered illegitimate or unauthorized by the self-proclaimed correct groups, the two most well-known being the Grand Orient of France and the Supreme Council of France. By the mid-1800s, there were over 50 different Masonic rites in France alone. Masonry was certainly going through its multiplication and division stage, uh, which we mentioned in the Mystery Religions of the Ancient course. But around the same time, a very particular or specific type of Masonry gained popularity in Europe, which was so-called Egyptian rites. There were two of them that stand out to us because of their association with Arnaldo Krumheller, Huiracocha, one of the authors that we study. The first was the Rite of Mizraim and was associated with the famous Count Cagliostro, often confused with Giuseppe Balsamo. And the second was the Rite of Memphis and seems to have been founded by J.E. Marconis de Negre. Both 
uh, I think I pronounced that wrong, but that's okay. Both Egyptian rites claimed that they were legitimately Egyptian. However, by comparing documents that are now available through the internet, it appears that both were an attempt to collect together and organize all the different alchemical degrees from France, as well as from elsewhere in Europe, because Germany had its own flavor, into a single unified system so that they could all be studied together. These systems, the Memphis and Mizraim rites, were, uh, had like 90 degrees or 93 or 97 degrees. The purpose of these old French Masonic symbolism classes is to shed light on these documents so that we can emphasize their beautiful, their beautiful esoteric teachings and the hidden Gnostic Kabbalah found within them. In, in some sense, we could say that in these, a few of these degrees, we can find those, the, the Gnosticism of the time, uh, people that were not afraid to study different religions and look at the, the similarity between them, the overlap between them. In the late 1800s, these two Egyptian rites were fused into a single organization called the Rite of Memphis Mizraim. This was done by the so-called International Grand Master Giuseppe Giribaldi. The Memphis Mizraim Rite was classified as high grade, because in other languages, grade is similar to degree, so in English we'd say high degree, masonry, high degree masonry because it apparently had over 90 degrees. Some say it had, you know, 96, and then they added a 97th, and some say it was 99. And But 90 degrees is very interesting because it's like, it speaks to us of, of a, a perpendicular, right, of changing a, a fixed amount. In 1905, after Garibaldi's death, a man named John Yarker took over as the International Grand Master and continued to promote the Memphis Mizraim right throughout the world. Later, Wiracocha, Arnaldo Krumheller, was made a Grand Master, 96th degree, for Central and South America. Okay, that was in 1900s. But uh, let's, let's back it up into the 1800s in France. So we're looking at a slice, a slice um, which is useful for us in this moment, but may not be another slice which we could look at later on, which is the late 1800s, early 1900s, and what's going on then. In any case, we're going to look at J.M. Ragon, Monsieur Ragon, and he was something like a, uh, he studied all these different degrees and wrote a bunch of documents, which can now be found online because somebody scanned them or multiple people scanned them and uh, tried to, to basically um, document all the different Masonic systems. Anyway, Jean-Marie Ragon was born in 1781, died in 1862, and he was initiated into masonry in 1804 at the lodge Les Amis du Nord, which means Friends from the North or Friends of the North, in Bruges, which I think is in Belgium. Then he moved to Paris, and he helped establish a famous lodge there named Les Trinosophes, which means the Trinosophies or Triple Wisdom where he delivered many lectures on ancient and modern initiations. These lectures were later collected together and published as Philosophical and Interpretive Course of Ancient and Modern Initiations in 1841. It was in two parts. The second part of which was censored by the Grand Orient, meaning that the Masonic body, the so-called uh, authority, said, uh, nope, you can't have that, can't publish that, it can't be allowed anymore. Anyway, that was, uh, you know, a while back, almost 200 years ago, so we have, we can get it now. Um, 
And I think there are some, some English translations, at least partially. Considered by many of his, his contemporaries as the most well-educated Freemason of the 19th century, he was the author of many Masonic works which had considerable influence at the time. Now they are of particular historical interest for our studies due to the details, explanations, and interpretations he has regarding initiatic symbolism. Additional books for which he is well known include The Mass and Its Mysteries Compared to the Ancient Mysteries or Complement of the Initiatory Science, Masonic Orthodoxy, Occult Masonry, and Hermetic Initiation. All three books published together and then Complete Manual of Masonry of Adoption or Ladies Masonry. And then he published a general Masonic Tyler and he revised many Masonic rituals, which were then published um, even after his death. So just glancing at the titles of his works, it becomes clear that he has read and studied a lot about Freemasonry and initiation. Blavatsky quotes him often as a Masonic authority. In Volume 3 of Her Secret Doctrine, she says, Masonry rests, according to Ragon, the great authority upon the subject, upon three fundamental degrees. The triple duty of a Mason is to study whence he came, what he is, and where he goes. The study, that is, of God, of himself, and of the future transformation. So now, let's see, let's take a look at some excerpts from Monsieur Ragon's books, starting in... Uh, 1853. So let's look at, at the citation here and we'll see if this is from Masonic Orthodoxy is the name of it. Subject studies in the ancient mysteries. So this is what he says were the subjects that were studied. On thaumaturgy, magnetism developed through the science and through the knowledge of the occult world was called thaumaturgy. A thaumaturge in the eyes of the vulgar was a miracle worker. Since then, ignorance has caused these denominations to be taken in a bad way. The sciences that follow are in the domain of thaumaturgy. So these are the sciences that follow. Prophecy. The hand of the Lord was upon him, and he prophesied. Progressive spirits, accustomed to the contemplation of astral and terrestrial phenomenon, regenerated in a profound and incessant meditation, exalted in the silence of retreat and in the collection of study, by the austerity of a life of application and by a violent restraint of the soul, experienced long ecstasies, during which their intellectual view, crossing the intervals, the spaces, and even the obstacles placed between them and reality, plunged into the future. They read therein the immutable destinies of empires and of nations, and their mouths proclaimed them with the sublime accent of inspiration, without them comprehending the chain of causes from which they derived. The College of Great Initiations was, in antiquity, a school of prophecy. Next subject, divination. Nothing important has happened in this world without having been predicted. According to the opinion of the mystics, all beings, from God down to the atom, have a particular number that distinguishes them and which becomes the source of their properties as well as of their destiny. Chance, according to Cornelius Agrippa, is in the end merely an unknown progression and time is merely a succession of numbers. Now, since the future is a composite of chance and of time, then they must serve for Kabbalistic calculations. 
in order to find the end of an event or the future of a destiny. Many have thought that Pythagoras was so named because in the predictions of the future he gave answers no less certain and true than those of the Pythian Apollo. This name would derive from Puthon, diviner, and from Agaros, assembly or gathering place. He discovered and taught the power of numbers, which, in his system, resolved the problem of cosmogony. There is, he said, a connection between the gods and numbers which constitutes the species of divination called arithmacy or arithmomacy. The soul is a world. It moves by itself. The soul contains the quaternary number within it. His science of numbers was based on Kabbalistic calculations. The astronomy he mysteriously taught was astrology, but his most secret science was alchemy. The Greeks, like the Egyptians, had divided divination into artificial by interpreting omens and soothsaying and into natural by dreams and oracles. They called the first mantike science by omens and auspices, and the second, manike, science by the delirium of the spirit. The Romans only knew the artificial divination, omen interpreting and soothsaying, which they regarded as uncertain or false. Thus we have the strange contradictions of Cicero in his opinions on this science and in his treatise on divination. Yet he was of the college of soothsayers and placed this dignity above all those of which he was clothed. So the next section is called On Psychology. Psychology, or psychology, is, part of philo is the part of philosophy that treats the soul, its faculties, and its operations. The philosophical science science of the soul, is the first rung of that immense ladder that must be climbed in order to know the truth. But in order to reach that goal, one must be like in the beginning, being man in the presence of nature, from which he receives impressions directly in the plentitude of their action. One must be completely exempt from scientific and religious prejudice, Science in general ignores politics and religion in order to be one and universal. On physiology, the philosophy of the future will be physiology perfected. Physiology is the science of the principles of the animal economy, of the usage and of the interplay of the organs. It is the science of life and of animated nature. It is through physiology that Lavater and Gall came to physio physiognomic, physiognomic and phrenologic discoveries. Vegetal physiology is the science of the vital functions of vegetables. Mineral physiology successfully occupies in this moment the time of some privileged scholars. Next section, on the occult sciences. Ignorance renders men gullible. The science of the mysteries of nature renders them believers. We think that skilled teachers, some of whom Masonry recognizes, will have a lot of interest in the works of the first two degrees, such that we invite them to establish, by basing themselves upon the development of the philosophical science, which we have just cited with enough detail to carry the proper conviction into the minds of educated Masons and those who are devoted enough to the expansion of useful knowledge in order to undertake this noble task. So we would no longer go out of our temples without benefit for our own intelligent understanding. The occult sciences will be reserved for the third philosophical degree, within which will be completed with the corresponding symbolic degree, the education of the modern initiate who, 
with close practice, will find themselves attaining the summit of ancient initiatic knowledge. Those who declare some fact quite impossible do not know the extent of possible. The occult sciences were always the prerogative of privileged understanding. They want to be studied in themselves and for themselves. They want a supporting zeal and an untiring perseverance. The principle is one, thus the light is one, and practical initiation is reserved for whosoever wills firmly, according to the axiom, axiom where there is a will, there is a way. The elite genii who have made themselves the institutors and the civilizers of the human being have wished to cultivate in man, in the human being, intelligent understanding, morality, and physics in order to help humanity reach happiness and the perfection that his nature allows him to achieve and to assist in his irresistible fondness to extend the limit of his power. on astrology. The knowledge of the phenomena of the sidereal world, of the influence of the stars on terrestrial bodies and the knowledge, knowledgeable interferences that were drawn, gave birth to astrology. Intimately linked to the close study of the luminaries and their revolution is, it is certainly the first and therefore the most ancient of the sciences and of the superstitions. The goal of astrologers was to predict the future through the inspection of the heavens. Qualities and virtues, or diverse influences upon man, upon empires, and upon future events, were all attributed to the twelve constellations and to the zodiac signs under the influence of the planets regarded as arbitrators of our destiny. The inferences drawn from the twelve signs, called the twelve houses of destiny, each of which had its particular influence, formed the genel, gen, genethliac, I'm not sure what that, I've never heard that term before, genethliac art, from the Greek genelethe, birth, or the art of horoscopes from aura, hour, and scope, I look, so looking at the hours. Plummy, I'm not sure I pronounced that one either, was an astrologer since he believed in these influences. Astrologers divided the physical existence of everything that breathes into four temperaments, the sanguine, the bilious, the melancholic, and the phlegmatic. Astrology applied to the microcosm, the human body, gave birth to physiognomy, which it divides into chiromancy, which comes from hand divination, uh, we also call it palm palmistry, and metoscopy from forehead reading, or to look at the forehead, which teach how to predict the future through the inspection of the lines of the hand and through the examination of the configuration of the face. It also gave birth to magism or magic. And this subject is divided into an infinite number of divinations by proper names, by the four elements, by the evocation of the shadows, by fish, etc. Astrology practiced in the Pythagorean school disappeared with the destruction of the initiatory colleges of Gaul in northern France by Caesar. Since then, there have only existed abuses of astrology. In the 16th century, the famous Tycho Brahe, who, although he had faith, made vain efforts in order to find it, charlatans and the almanacs of Liège in Belgium exploited its fame. Next section. You can see it should be getting more and more useful as we progress.
more and more uh, what we're interested in, right? On the Kabbalah. Fortunate is he who is able to know the causes of things. The mysterious laws which regulate the invisible world, known since the highest antiquity, gave birth to a science which later was named Kabbalah or sacred tradition. This science is independent of epics and of religious forms. Easterners, whether Indian or Arabic or Hebrew, the Europeans, Catholics, Greeks, and Protestants, all equally admit the principles and the combinations of this science. The Kabbalistic doctrine was, for a long time, the religion of the wise and of the learned, because, like Freemasonry, it constantly tends towards spiritual perfection and towards the fusion of beliefs and of nationalities among men. To the eyes of the Kabbalists, all men are brothers, and their relative ignorance is, for him, simply a reason to teach them. There were illustrious Kabbalists among the Egyptians, among the Greeks, whose Orthodox Church has accepted the Kabbalistic doctrines. The Arabs have also produced many Kabbalists whose wisdom was not rejected by the Church of the Middle Ages. The, Seri, the sages carried the name of Kabbalists. The Kabbalah contained a noble, pure, not mysterious, but symbolic philosophy. It taught the dogma of the unity of God, the art of knowing and of explaining the essence and the operations of the Supreme Being, of spiritual powers and of natural forces, and of determining their action through symbolic figures, through the arrangement of the alphabet, through combinations of numbers, through the reversal of letters from writing, and by means of hidden meanings that it claims to discover. The Kabbalah is the key of the occult sciences. The Gnostics were born as Kabbalists. It's from 1853. On Magism, or Magic. Neither young nor old men should remain strangers to the study of philosophy. One is never too young to learn how to be able to balance oneself in order to be initiated into the practice of this science. Otherwise, it would mean that it would not yet be time to be happy, or it is too late to be happy. The Magi, the sages of the ancient East, observed and studied the nature of man, the mechanism of his thinking, the faculties of his soul, his power over nature, and the essence of his of the properties and of the occult virtue of each thing. Magism is the science of sciences, or rather, it is the assembly of all human sciences or knowledge. This is why, in antiquity, the Magi were the most learned philosophers. In fact, a Magus must be initiated into the principal sciences. First, the preparatory science is the knowledge of ancient languages, the Kabbalistic signs, numbers, alphabets, talismanic and other hieroglyphics, which are used in occultism. On the magic of words. In Origen, I believe he was a... Uh, Roman, but he, he wrote in Latin, actually, I don't know uh, what his nationality was. We read, in Origen, we read, There are some names that naturally have virtue, such as those which are used by the sages among the Egyptians, the Magi in Persia, the Brahmins in India. What is called magic is not a vain and illusory art, as was claimed by the Stoics and the Epicureans. The name Sabaoth, that of Adonai, were not made by created beings, but they belong to a mysterious theology that relates to the Creator. The virtue of these names comes from there. When they are arranged and pronounced according to the rules... We know that the sacred word Jehovah 
was among the Jews an ineffable name. Ineffable meaning unpronounceable, unspeakable. In order for its correct pronunciation not to be lost among the Levites, the high priest uttered it in the temple once in the year on the tenth day of the month of Tisri, the day of the great fast of atonement. During the ceremony, it was recommended for people to produce a loud noise so that the sacred name was not heard except by those who had the right to hear it. Since all others, say the Jews, would have been immediately struck dead. The great Egyptian initiates before the Jews did the same in regard to the word Isis, which they regarded as a sacred and incommunicable word. When the Jewish high priest uttered, according to the rules, the word Jehovah, it was said, Shem Ham Foresh, meaning the name is well pronounced. These three words form the sacred word of a Scottish degree. This belief is found at the head of the instructions of the third degree of the Knight of the Black Eagle, called Rose Cross. So now he's going to give some excerpts from a Kabbalistic degree. It has a catechism, right? A question and answer. Question. What is the most powerful name of God on the pentacle? Answer. Adonai. Question. What is its power? Answer. To set the universe in motion. One of the knights who had the good fortune to speak it Kabbalistically would have at his disposal the powers that inhabit the four elements and the celestial spirits and would possess all possible human virtues. That's the end of the quote. The ancients believed that the soul of a man was reclothed after his death in a similar form to the one he had during his life so that it could be distinguished from another soul. Though it could, on occasion, come visit places it had inhabited, visit its parents, its friends, converse with them, instruct them, and show them the manner of invoking it. So the word abraxas, pronounced with some ceremony, was passed on in order to make the souls appear with whom one wanted to speak. Okay, so that was called on the magic of words. Next section, the magic of willpower. Keep in mind, this is in a book called Masonic Orthodoxy. Long book, right? So back in those times, they would write these long books because if, if you just published it like this and somebody like the Catholic Church, who was very strong in, in France, were to find it or you had a, a, a name that was too strong in the title of the book, then you'd uh, have to deal with the repercussions because it was they who were in control of, of uh, what was basically what was authorized. And the reason that in 1854 and 1856, Eliphaz Levy was able to write a book called Dogma of High Magic and Ritual of High Magic, he was a former Catholic priest. He resigned his position for personal reasons, but he understood how to play that game. He had written a book earlier in his life, in the 1840s, and he got locked up. So he understood that you had to speak in a certain way not necessarily uh, explicitly saying things, but pointing things out so that people who understood could get it, but without, um, you know, putting the cards on the table, so to speak. So this is a little bit before that time, but you can see he doesn't give everything, but he gives a fair amount, and he uh, quotes other documents and is just referring to them. The magic of willpower. We know that a man has a magnetic spirituality, which, when strongly supported by the will, is the most powerful tool that he has at his disposal. Right? And he's saying man, but man, man and woman. Therefore, one can call the magic of willpower that vital and propulsive influence which acts so powerfully upon the soul and the spirit of the magnetized persons or objects and which puts into motion even inanimate objects 
according to the words of Virgil, the spirit agitates matter. Magnetizing is making magic. Next section. Let us relegate magnetism in religious sanctuaries, eager to escape the corrupt hands of the charlatans who compromise it and the hands of the dreamers who ridicule it. Magnetism is, as we have already indicated, a constantly active, vital, and curative force which permeates and animates everything. It is electricity that is animalized, vitalized, intentionalized, and propulsive. The magnetizing power of which produces such extraordinary effects upon the very mysterious springs of the human organism that they seem to contain magic, since it is not yet given to science to explain the physical causes no more than the life functions, the functions of nourishment, of reproduction, and of a thousand other things. But we firmly believe that the well-studied magnetism, or if one wishes, the science of the magi, is the golden key that opens the still impenetrable sanctuary where the studious and persevering adept will initiate themselves into the mysteries of their being and of their destiny. The study of the action of man's spirit over matter and which, through his willpower, he uses to animate his life, as Prometheus once animated clay, imbuing it with the celestial fire which he stole from the gods, inevitably allows the initiate to know the action of the universal spirit in all of nature and to realize the difference between eternal phenomenon and those which are only ephemeral. The principal one, the spirit of man, is of the same nature as the universal spirit, which is to say, psychologically and with reason, that man, the human soul, was made in the image of of God. So, that was our sort of introductory part. Now, in the second part, we're going to look at uh, what he talks about in regards to philosophical masonry or hermetic initiation. Still from 1853. Well, let's check and see if you guys have any questions or comments. Doesn't look like it. All right. Philosophical Masonry or Hermetic Initiation Initiation was a tradition organizing and preserving the secret sciences. The preamble that we think should be given in this third part of Masonic Orthodoxy, which is also the second part of Occult Masonry, is simply an extract of the discourse of the orator in the hermetic degree of the true mason. So that's the name of the degree, true mason. So the orator expresses himself thus. The science to which we are initiating you is the first and the most ancient. It emanates from nature, or rather it is nature itself perfected by the art and founded upon experience. Throughout all the centuries, there have been adepts, and if in our days artists spend their works and their time in vain, it is because, far from imitating their simplicity and following the right ways which they traced, they adorn it with a makeup that it cannot handle and lose themselves in a labyrinth where their foolish imagination leads them. From there comes the mockery of those profane people who, without respect for God and without esteem for the art, turn our most serious mysteries into derision. From there come the crude satires of these ignorant people who, too heavy from their senses to elevate themselves to the sublimity of our knowledge, blaspheme everything that they cannot comprehend. From there come the, the ridic those who ridicule, I'm sorry, from there come the ridicule assumed by these lazy people who, unless a skillful mind and a laborious hand is able to somehow give them all the costs of the discovery and of the work, despise those people who despise everything, 
and have neither the force or strength to imagine nor the courage to execute the work. From there comes the offensive libels from these reckless people who, with a boldness which is full of bad faith, dare to put the truth and the hermetic science among fabulous inventions and popular superstitions. With no other motive than the desire to invalidate the authenticity and the impossibility of destroying the evidence. Abandon these children of darkness and these enemies of themselves to all the shame of their vain and inconsistent ideas. For us, the true children of the light and sincere, sincere friends of humanity, who see the truth in our teachings, let us enjoy the benefits and the sweetness that it gives us. Foundations of Hermetic Masonry This masonry or science that crowns all that the human genius has, that all the human genius has been able to conceive of as most sublime, rests upon three columns. Faith, which must lead the work, hope, which accompanies it, charity, which follows the success of the work. Hermetic Citations Let us add, before entering into the matter, some extracts of hermetic instruction which will prove to Masons who have been raised to mastery which means they've achieved the, the third degree in their Blue Lodge system, that they will only comprehend the hidden sense of their degree well after being initiated into the science of Hermes. You see what he's saying? Once you understand Hermeticism, then you'll understand what the third degree of Masonry is. He says that only if they have the good luck through their merit and their studies to be admitted. They will also encounter in the Kabbalistic citations which follow the striking concordance of the religious doctrines with the secret doctrines of the high initiates, to which they seem to serve as a veil, which has made Bacon, Francis Bacon, say, a little bit of science makes a skeptic, lots of science makes a believer. So now we have some more catechisms here. Question, are you a supreme commander of the stars? Answer, I have seen the direction of their rays. Right, so, so supreme commander of the stars is probably the name of the degree. So it's like a title. Have you seen the, uh, I have seen the direction of their rays. What does the earth that receives these rays signify? That without it, we cannot mason, and that the living fire is necessary for it. What does the buried body of Hiram mean? That within the earth is enclosed the most beautiful of secrets. Right? If we study Arcanum 9, we'll understand that one. What have you encountered within the earth? The brute stone, upon which three was the number seven. What does the tomb of Hiram represent? That the first matter, or materia prima, can only be reproduced after putrefaction. What does the very fortunate, the very respectable brother, that's another title of someone who participated, represent in the lodge? Hiram, or the first matter, which, after the putrefaction, becomes the living fountain. Why is he seated in the east? Because it must be that all matter is exposed to the rays of the sun, from the rising to the setting. Why were you made to lie upon the tablet or tracing board? because the very fortunate brother represents the first matter in putrefaction. Why were you pulled by the finger? To remind me that every good mason must assure himself whether or not the matter 
is rotten before passing on to the second operation. Uh, we refer you to the legend of uh, the three, the uh, legend of the death of Hiram Abiff, or the legend of Hiram Abiff that we studied in the second class. Why do you hold yourself in the lodge with your arms crossed in order to testify about the patience that one must have in order to succeed? What does the word strength or force signify upon the blazing star, the black matter, indicator of putrefaction? What does the word wisdom signify upon the moon, the white matter, sign of putrefaction? purification what does the word beauty signify upon the sun the red matter source of all good why was a blindfold put over your eyes in order to show me that although I am a mason I was in darkness what age are you the number 15 3 plus 5 plus 7 so that's the end of the excerpt related with the Supreme Commander of the Stars. This next one is uh, looks like it's called Knight of the Kabbalah. Question, why did you have yourself received as a Knight of the Kabbalah? Answer, in order to know, through numbers, the admirable harmony that there is between nature and religion. How were you announced? With twelve knocks. What did they signify? The twelve foundations of our temporal and spiritual happiness. What is a Kabbalist? A man who has learned, through tradition, the sacerdotal art and the royal art. Sacerdotal means like priestly. What does this motto signify? Omnia in numeris sita sunt. That everything lies in numbers. Can you explain this to me? I can do so up to the number 12. Your wisdom will grasp the rest. In the number 10, what signifies the unity? God creating an animating matter expressed by zero, which alone has no value. How do you understand the unity? So now there's a bunch of answers here that are, uh, so the physical unity, a verb, Incarnated in the bosom of a virgin, a religion. How do you understand the unity in moral order? A spirit corporized in a virgin earth, nature. Corporeal or corporized means into a body or related with a body. So a spirit given a body in a virgin earth, nature. How do you understand the number two? Man and woman the agent, and the patient. How do you understand the number three? The three theological virtues, the three principles of bodies. How do you understand the number four? The four cardinal virtues, the four elementary qualities. How do you understand the number five? The quintessence of religion, the quintessence of matter. How do you understand the number six? The theological cube, the physical cube. How do you understand the number seven? The seven sacraments, the seven planets. How do you understand the number eight? The small number of elect, the small number of sages. How do you understand the number nine? The exaltation of religion. The exaltation of matter. How do you understand the number 10? 
the ten precepts of the law, the ten precepts of nature. How do you understand the number 11? The multiplication of religion, the multiplication of nature. How do you understand the number 12? The 12 articles of faith, the 12 operations of nature. The twelve apostles, foundation of the holy city, who have preached through all the earth for our spiritual happiness. The twelve signs of the zodiac, foundation of the prime mobile, spread through all the universe for our temporal happiness. The rabbi, president of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin adds, so you must participate also in the uh, practice. He says, Of all that you have just said, the result is that the unity develops itself into two, achieves itself in three on the inside in order to produce four on the outside, from where through six, seven, eight, nine, it arrives at five, half of the spheric number, which is ten in order to show by passing through the number 11 to the number 12 and in order to elevate itself through the number 4 times 10 into the number 6 times 12, termed term and fulfillment of our eternal happiness. And then it continues with the questions, which is the generative number? In the divinity, it is the unity. In created things, it is the number two, because divinity, one, engenders two, and because in created things, two engenders one. What is the most majestic number? It is the number three, because it denotes the triple divine essence. What is the most mysterious number? It is the number four, because it encloses all the mysteries of nature. What is the most occult number? It is the number five, because it is enclosed in the center of the compounds. What is the most wholesome number? It is the number six, because it encloses the source of our spiritual and temporal happiness. What is the number what is the most fortunate number? It is the number seven because it directs us to dedicate to um, it directs us to the decad, the perfect number. Decad means uh, ten. What is the most desired number? It is the number eight because whosoever possesses it is numbered among the elect and among the sages. What is the most sublime number? It is the number nine, because through it religion and nature are exalted. What is the most perfect number? The number ten, because it contains the unity, which has made everything, and the zero, symbol of matter and of chaos, out of which everything has emerged. It is comprehended then, in its figure, to be the created and the uncreated, the beginning and the end, power and force or strength, life and nothingness. In the study of numbers are found the correlation of all things, the power of the Creator, the faculties of creation, the Alpha and the Omega of the divine science. What is the most multipliable number? It is the number 11. Because with the possession of the two unities, one arrives at the multiplication of all things. What is the most solid number? It is the number 12, because it is the foundation of our spiritual and temporal happiness. What is the number favored by religion and by nature? It is the number 4 times 10, because it enables us, by releasing all that is impure, to eternally enjoy the number 6 times 12. What does the square signify? I think they're talking about the tool, right? The square and the compass. 
The square is the symbol of the four elements contained in the triangle. Oh, maybe not. Also the emblem of the three alchemical principles. These things reunited form the absolute unity in the first matter. What does the center of the circumference signify? It signifies the universal spirit, vivifier of nature. What do you understand by the quadrature of the circle? The search for the quadrature of the circle indicates that of the knowledge of the four vulgar elements, which themselves are composed of elementary spirits or principal principles, as well as the knowledge of the circle, although round, which is composed of lines that escape the view and are not captured by the understanding. As attributes, to whom do salt, sulfur, and mercury belong? Salt is the attribute of the Father, sulfur that of the Son, and the mercury that of the Holy Spirit. From the action of these three, result the triangle in the square and the seven ang angles, the decad or ten, the perfect number. What is the most confused figure? Zero, emblem of chaos, the unformed mixture of the elements. What do the four mottos of the degree signify? That one must understand, see, keep quiet, and enjoy one's happiness. So that's from Philosophical Masonry from 1853. So we don't have uh, any notes for this class. We recommend that you um, meditate on these questions and answers. And uh, we're going to stop there and open it up for questions and comments. If you have any, uh, oh, we have one right here. Why virgin in all religions, including the mother of Jesus? This is a good question. Um, because virgin implies uh, purity, right? And so we need to purify ourselves. And uh, in order to be born, through uh, a purified being, through a purified mother, or the process of uh, being reborn, as it's called in Christianity, is accomplished through the rebirth through our Divine Mother, who is a virgin, and even uh, esoterically speaking, a person who does not waste their creative energy is considered a virgin, even if physically they are not a virgin, meaning they've had intercourse. It doesn't mean that spiritually they are not. So we're talking about a, a spiritual virginity that means a spiritual purity. They have reached a level of uh, purity in themselves, the way that they manage their creative energy, the way that they handle themselves during the sexual act, the way they manage that, right? As you know, if you've been following us, we study white tantra. We use that technique in order to clean the creative energy, in order to purify it and to purify ourselves, combined with the work on ourselves to eliminate the ego, to eliminate desire, to eliminate our defects, If you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to uh, leave them. In the Catechism, it says, how do you understand the unity of verb incarnated in the, ver in the bosom of a virgin? The verb, verb is an action word, doing, right? A religion, a spirit corporized in a virgin earth, nature. All right, well, if we're, we'll wait here a couple more moments, see if there's any other questions or comments, but we want to invite you to join us next week 
we're going to read some more catechisms, um, specifically from some Masonic systems that uh, are relevant to Arnaldo Krumheller. We'll look at uh, some information related to his history, what he says about that. We're going to look at some apprentice. Probably we'll look at one from the apprentice, one or two from apprentice, one or two from companion or uh, fellow craft, and one or two from the master degree. And, and the goal is to cover at least one of those Memphis Mizraim degrees. Because the Egyptian, so-called French Egyptian ones, they're very interesting because they give a lot of information. So we'll see. We'll see. We're still refining which ones we're going to quote from, but we recommend that you take a look at those as well. If you're interested in these subjects, you can tell it's a different way of instructing. You had to, you, you know, you are going to be questioned and you had to have the answer. You had to know the answer. And so it was a back and forth and everybody had to learn those answers so that everybody had the same uh, sort of curriculum that they covered. And from that, we all, we all as a group would have the same base, you know, sort of starting or jumping off point. So that we'll, we'll cover some of those next week. It uh, doesn't look like there's any questions or comments right now, so we recommend um, if you have them now or going forward if you listen to this after it's been recorded and posted to leave them in the comments area, and we'll do our best to to respond to them. I want to thank you for your time, for spending time with us, for your attention, and as always, we want to wish you the best in your esoteric work. <laughs>